Sonic, the heart of your system. Comet Lake is finally here, as you've probably seen by the time that this video is up. Plenty of other videos should also be online. Actually, the time while I'm shooting this video, it's the beginning of April and I got the CPU not directly from Intel, but from different sources. Therefore, my information about this platform is also kind of limited. It was also a bit confusing to me that I saw when I opened CPU-Z, it's listing socket 1159 LGA, while the socket cap itself is reading LGA 1200. Therefore, I was a little bit confused, but it should be 1200, right? But yeah, by the time this video should be up, um, I think we all should have information about this platform. For today's video, we will straight focus about LN2 performance. We will try how high we can push the CPU on liquid nitrogen. I ordered 30 liters so we can play around with the CPU, see if it has cold bug, if we can overclock it maybe to 7 gigahertz, something in this direction. That's what I would expect if we compare it, for example, with the previous 9900K. Everything is set up already on the table. It's currently running on air, just a 5 gigahertz base profile. I'm also running 3800 3, on memory, which is also just a base profile to keep the memory safe. Memory is not on 100% performance, it's just so we can test the CPU. Uh, the first thing we have to do is prepare the mainboard, so insulation stuff, let's go. For today's video we are going to use an Asus Maximus 12 Apex. 12th generation already from the Maximus series. Quite cool that they kept it for so long. Also, I don't really know how the board design will eventually look like because you can see it's just a naked board. No heat sinks at all, not even for the PCH or for the VRM, which is not going to be necessary on LN2. Even the PCH is absolutely fine. Power consumption of those is maybe like 4 watt. We also just spotted something quite interesting on this Apex board. There is a PCB part hanging off the board right here. It's fixed with a little bit of tape, but only yeah, only very small amount of PCB is still keeping it in place. It's directly behind the SATA connectors and it says remove for emergency use only. It looks like a bottle opener, but I'm really not sure what this is. Maybe we should try it. I really hope this was the correct intention of this thing or if I was completely wrong. Anyway, the PCB seems to be not strong enough to open the bottle. It broke apart a little bit. And if this was used correctly, I would give it the award of the weirdest mainboard feature I've ever seen in my entire life. Starting with Mibenko liquid rubber, basically liquid insulation tape. We will spread it all around the socket and also on the backside of the board just to prevent any kind of short circuits which could occur by the condensation. Alright, mainboard just dried overnight. I gave it a little bit more time because I really applied a lot of liquid rubber and I was not sure if everything is completely dry. That's why we just waited completely overnight and then it should be fine. Now we're going to perform some basic pre-testing on water, which should be helpful for the LN2 testing because sometimes Especially when you're running LN2, then you suddenly get some instabilities and you never really know where they come from. It could be just that there's some condensation somewhere. It could be that the memory doesn't like that it's getting cold or whatever. And to be sure that you have one basic setting that's 100% stable, you should do some basic pre-testing. And that's what we're going to do on water. Because on water I can just use the same mounting mechanism as what I'm using for the LN2 container. 
So just quickly using this water block with a 360 radiator. I expect the same kind of clocks what we've seen previously on a 9900K or 9900KS. Shouldn't be a big difference, but we will see how this thing performs. Also, we're mounting the VGA in the very first slot. There is a PCI Express times 4 slot on top, which kind of also collides with an M.2 slot that's sitting on top. Before I was doing the Allen 2 stuff or before I was just setting up the rig, I had an M.2 drive in the M.2 slot on top. Which is cool because the Apex board now finally also has an M.2 slot, not only on the DIM.2 but also on the board itself. But if we want to populate the PCI Express X4 slot, we had to remove it. That's what I did. And now just performing the basic testing. Unfortunately, the CPU is not as nice or not as good as I expected. It's still good considering that it has 10 cores, it can run at 5.2 GHz at 1.3 volt through all benchmarks, can also pass Cinebench R15 at that voltage and 5.3 GHz. However, I cannot pass Cinebench R20 simply because it's getting way too warm. And I think that's just because it has 10 cores and it's a very high frequency, therefore the power consumption will drastically increase. But considering that we have a 360 radiator on here, we have a DDC that's running at 100%, basically a custom water cooling loop, and you just cannot remove the heat as fast as necessary. The CPU will instantly reach about 90 to 95 degrees Celsius at 5.3 gigahertz, 1.32 volts, something in that direction at uh, Cinebench R20, and then get unstable due to high temperature. And I think that's just because we cannot get rid of the heat, and it's not because the cooling is not good enough because the radiator is really not getting that warm it's just yeah very high power density on a small chip therefore yeah you need very very high cooling and i think that's what we're going to do time to mount the allen 2 container i also wanted to give you the base performance of what we just talked about cpu is running 5.2 gigahertz across all cores right now also 5 gigahertz on the cache 3800 c16 as i said before and Cinebench R15 performance, 2822 in multi, 230 in single. R20 is 6761 points in multi, 540 in single. And maximum temperature in R20 multi was 93 degrees Celsius, which is really the limit. First step is to cool down to about minus 80 degrees Celsius, then we have to enter the BIOS, apply some settings like a PLL termination voltage, VCCIO voltage, and then uh, we can basically flip to switches, LN2 mode and the reserved switch 1. Then we should be able to boot at around minus 170 or go even full pot. We will see how it works out, but first step is cool down from 26 degrees Celsius to about minus 80. LN2 mode is enabled, it's something you really should only use when you're using LN2 or dry ice, just negative temperatures. And then we also have the reserved switch 1 and 2, using both of them at about minus 100 degrees Celsius to be able to boot at low temperatures. One last trick we're going to use for LN2 cooling, if you're hitting about minus 60, minus 70 degrees Celsius, you can always use your heat gun or a torch to torch the container from the inside and then you have some ice crystals building up. Basically the same what you have on the outside because of the humidity you have in the air you will have some ice crystals also inside the container and the ice crystals will 
break the gas layer which is caused by the light and frost effect means that you have your LN2, you have your warm container, your copper mass and in between you have a gas layer and the gas layer is insulating both components and will decrease your thermal transfer and if you use the heat gun and have some ice crystals inside it will speed it up significantly. We're currently at about minus 95 degrees Celsius and you can see just by the amount of uh, fume or I'm not sure how you're gonna call that in English maybe leave it down in the comments um, that's building up from the evaporating LN2 the amount is so much higher because it's so much faster evaporation and the cooling is also much higher um, we're getting in a region where we should be able to boot right now the debug code still shows zero zero and we have to keep decreasing the temperature and hit the retry button which is essentially reapplying your bias settings every single time until we're low enough in temperature so we're booting and then we can see the debug code working essentially because those reserved switches are increasing some voltages in the background which makes it a lot easier for us extreme overclockers to boot it's not much effort to do it but um, the temperature is still at minus 100 degrees celsius to warm to boot we have to keep decreasing the temperature Unfortunately, Sheik has to stay outside today because I know she's very curious and would like to see this even up close, but I think this could be too dangerous for the little cat. You know what, it's just so absolutely amazing how easy extreme overclocking has become over the last, I would say, five to six years. If you compare it with like 10 to 15 years ago, it's a completely different story nowadays. I mean, the only thing I really did was cooling down applying 1.45 V CCIO, 1.75 PLL termination voltage, flip the switches, cool down, full pot. I'm already running 6 GHz, 1.7 volt. Obviously the CPU will be able to clock higher, but it's just it's a piece of cake really, I can show it. So all I did was opening Turbo V Core, set CPU co-voltage 1.75 right now for a start. As said before, PLL termination is 1.75. Already increased the all core turbo frequency to 6.2. Can increase it to 6.3, should also be no problem. Now we can rerun R15. Yeah, 32.68 score in R15. We're going to attempt to break the 7 gigahertz barrier with the 10 core. With the 9900K, we actually did 7.6 GHz, but it was also running with liquid helium, which is a little bit of an unfair comparison, considering that liquid helium is like 50 times more expensive and about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius colder. You would only run like 30 degrees colder on the container itself, maybe 40 degrees, not that much more, but it's still a significant uh, benefit. I'm currently running 6.8 at 1.84 volt and we're just trying how high we can push it step by step. The maximum we could get for just validation purpose was about 7.25 gigahertz. That's the highest I could see. We quickly touched about 7.3 gigahertz. Unfortunately, it was not stable enough to get a shot of it or also to make a validation file. I also want to highlight that I'm running everything on... Okay, had a quick shutdown, everything is fixed, still, still fine. I also want to highlight that everything I'm doing right here is running 10 cores, 20 threads. Those CPUs technically allow to run hyper threading per core, which means that you can also do 10 cores, 14 threads for example, depending what kind of application you want to run, which is something you can also do for validation purpose. A lot of people are, for example, running only two cores for validation and then claim that they're running the highest validation ever on a 10 900K, which in my opinion really doesn't make much sense because, I mean, why would you run only two cores on high frequency on a 10 core and then claim you're running very high frequency, it doesn't make much sense. Next uh, thing we want to try is Cinebench R15. Therefore, we will use a little bit lower voltage for validation. It was about 1.9 volt, now about 1.75, 1.85 volt. So far looking pretty good. The previous world record was with a 10 900X, which is Socket 2066, Cascade Lake X, running at about just above 6 gigahertz as far as I can remember. 
and the score was th uh, 34-10, roughly. We're now running 34-68, so we already beat the previous world record on 10 core Cinebench R15, running 6.5 on the core and 6.2 gigahertz on the cache. There's so one more thing I want to show you quickly, and that's like the boiling behavior inside the container. If I refill the LN2 right now, you can maybe hear the boiling, boiling a little bit in the background. Not sure if you can hear it, I hope so. But if I'm going to launch the benchmark right now, it's 6.6 gigahertz, 1.8 volt, which will be a significant amount of heat which we have to remove from the, from the CPU with a cooler. And the removal of heat is done by the evaporation of the LN2. And you can hear it and you can also see it, how the LN2 starts to increase boiling. And you can also see and hear when the benchmark is over, it will decrease in boiling. The highest I could run quickly after like 5-6 liters LN2 was just above 6.7 GHz. Closing in on 300 points in R15 single, almost 3600 points in R15 multi. Going to rerun this quickly for you. Obviously you could tune this further by increasing cache maybe another 100 or 200 megahertz. Also tighten the memory, this is very loose stuff right here, uh, 3600, uh, 3800 C16. So yeah, if you would spend a lot of time on this you could easily squeeze another 100 points out of this. But so far it's still 200 points above the previous world record which is kind of satisfying. So much for 10900K overclocking. To be honest, I mean those CPUs are still fun to overclock, they overclock really really well because you can go down really low in temperature, they scale, re scale really nicely with cold, but in the end the 10900K feels still the same like 9900K, like 8700K, like 7700K, like 6700K, they're all pretty much the same when it comes to LN2 overclocking, all scale really really nicely with cold, starting from 9900K because they're soldered. It's a lot easier for overclocking because you don't have like tim cracking and stuff and the main boards also developed further that's why it's even easier for us for LN2 overclocking all the CPUs have been the same Asus and Kodi figured out how to improve things it's really easy it's still a lot of fun I'm also quite satisfied with the results considering that I only have this very small amount of liquid nitrogen not that much time still 7.2 gigahertz across all cores uh, 6.7 gigahertz easily stable for Cinebench R15 that's quite good and we will end this right now because there's also a lot of ice building up on the side and a little bit of condensation on areas where I thought it would not get that cold and uh, I don't want to risk the board and the CPU because it's only set up I have currently and I will need it for additional testing. So much for this video, thanks for joining in, I hope you enjoyed this extreme overclocking content, see you next time, bye! During this assembly I spotted something quite cool. You can see that there's, it looks like there's a line drawn just on the area of the capacitors in the middle and you can see a lot of ice on the left and nothing on the right. That's due to the fact that we have those power planes on the left transferring all the current and therefore also the heat and cold from the CPU and 
On the right, we don't have that much copper, therefore no ice.